Hey everybody, it is Mr. Chris here. Uh, just posting your next section of notes for uh, the Great Depression. I guess this would be our first section of notes for the Great Depression. Uh, just to start things out um, on our classroom, again, you can see we have our topic here for the Great Depression and the New Deal. I have posted on there your crash course episode, which most of you guys have um, started and completed already, which is great. If not, just make sure you're getting that done. Uh, your vocab is going to be on there. It's obviously a link that just takes you right to Quizlet. So if you want to be studying or looking over terms, go ahead and do that. We'll probably have our vocab quiz within the next, I don't know, week or so. So just be keeping up on those. Maybe look at it 5, 10, 15 minutes a day. Nothing too crazy. And then I will be attaching your notes here. Um, I'm going to go through them with you today. What we're going to do is slightly different for the first section of notes here. As you can see, you're going to have your slides with blanks. And then I'm going to have kind of our master slides here that we'll go through together for you guys to watch, read, listen to, all those things I know you want to be spending time doing. Uh, your assignment for today, along with your section one notes, is going to be um, our flow cab section on uh, the Great Depression. I will attach the username and password. It's Mr. Aaron's email and then greatest. Um, and you guys can go on there. Your assignment will be your, uh, to fill in the blanks for the lyrics. Okay, so I'll go ahead and get started. I don't want to waste too much more of your time. We'll do our opening question here once everything loads up. All right, so starting off on the Great Depression, um, obviously there's a whole bunch of things we kind of already have in our brains about it already. Just kind of talking about Black Tuesday and the stock market crash, talking about um, – the unemployment rate, people living in shanty towns, so on and so forth. So we're going to cover a lot of how we got there today and why the Great Depression started. Your opening question says, to take ownership of land and evict families from it. Parentheses, typically the banks or government who gave out the loan in the first place are the ones that do this. So what's it mean to take ownership of land and evict the families from it? We call this foreclosure or foreclosed. This is something or a practice that still happens today, uh, a lot more rarely than it did during the Great Depression. Um, so I just wanted to put that out there now because we're going to talk about banks and loans and how that works here during the Great Depression and why um, things escalated so quickly. Also, this helps explain when we're talking about well, how did people end up in shanty towns and living on the streets? It's because a lot of them couldn't afford to make payments on their mortgages, on their car loans, on whatever it would be and they had those things foreclosed on. Your schedule for today, there's your opening question we just did. Again, depending on when you're watching this, um, you either do or do not need to be signing in. The only days you need to sign in on our Google Forms are on Tuesdays and Thursdays. So just make sure if we haven't figured that out yet by now, that's what you're doing. We're gonna do our section one notes today together. Like I said, your vocab words are up and running on Quizlet, and then your assignment today is going to be to do your flow cab that kind of goes along with this. All right? Let us rock and or roll. Yes, that was a very cheesy thing to say, but I'm okay with it. Ooh, very dramatic uh, background there. Make it pop. Very nice. Okay, Great Depression is going to start in late 1920s and obviously last for the better part of the 1930s until we get to World War II. So let's talk today about the causes. By the time we're done today, we're going to see we have five of these arrows. We're going to, have, again, you know me, it's my theme here. We don't just have black and white simple explanations for things. we got to go through and talk about why these different arrows all happened, leading to that spark of the stock market crash, Black Tuesday, which takes us into the Great Depression. Okay, so think a lot like World War I. We have our different causes, and they're all going to be coming from different walks of life. So starting off, our first reason that we're going to see the Great Depression happen is quite simply just less trade. Not trading Pokemon cards, not trading Basemon cards. Did I say Basemon? That's supposed to be baseball. Wow. Get it together, Mr. Chris. What is Basemon? Okay. Hope everyone had a good laugh there. Um, so not trading of like simple things like we do in the schoolyard, but the idea of shipping goods and services and resources back and forth. After World War I, in a nutshell... The United States did far less trading, especially with Europe, because of their already starting depression and what's going on there as far as trying to rebuild their nations. U.S. kept what we call tariffs, 
aka taxes on imports and exports, very high to try to make it so other countries would not trade with us. Now, there were good effects on that. Because we're not trading as much with the rest of the world, America is making everything. So uh, we don't have as much competition with those other places. We're the ones producing, building, making cars. We have oil, we have steel, and we're selling it all around the world. However, some of the bad parts of that, first of all, it made a lot of tense relationships with those foreign countries that we used to have good relationships with. Um, we've seen that like in modern day America, we've talked about raising tariffs on like China and how that had kind of a negative impact on our relationship with them in like 2019, 2018. Another bad effect, it also prevented foreign countries from getting out of debt. If those other countries can't trade back and forth with us because we're making it hard, there's no way for them to dig themselves out of their post-war reparations. As it says here, the government revenue comes from taxes on people, businesses. When businesses are doing poorly, there's less tax money coming out. Countries that are in debt and or economic depression buy less stuff. So because there's less trading, it's going to be harder for these countries to get out of their own depression. Again, leading into World War I. We see, obviously, those war reparations are still active and still a big part of things. Germany is unable to pay off their loans to Britain and France. Now, America steps in during this point. Our, our economy is booming. We are thriving. We're building more. Think about our 1920s stuff we read and talked about. They're making more money than ever before. We are able to loan Germany money, hoping they pay us back with interest so that they can make their payments to Great Britain and France. It's also in our best interest to help do this because Great Britain and France are also paying back us for our role in World War I. So if Germany can make their payments, Britain and France can make their payments to us. This cycle was looked at as like, oh, this will help America get even more money off of winning World War I. A lot of these nations we talked about in Europe had a hard time shifting back to peacetime. They didn't have to make as much stuff anymore. They didn't have to be producing and building tanks and guns and whatever it may be. So that demand for goods that they were making drops greatly. And this leads to a lot of stress on nations like Germany and nations like Italy and other parts of Eastern Europe. It also quite like obviously, if we think about it, and I know some of you guys have had world history before, it leads to a lot of tension in those European countries. After World War One, places like Germany and Italy, um, Western parts of Russia or like Poland, Czechoslovakia, a lot of these nations all were told you should use democracy. We need to use democracy. But as their uh, democratic nations are put in place, like the Weimar Republic in Germany, they're also associated with the Great Depression and the failings of what's happening. So it leads to this rise in radical leaders saying democracy doesn't work. People like Hitler, people like Mussolini, and that's what's going to lead to a lot of instability in Europe. Sorry, I mentioned that last slide there, the rise of radical leaders. All right, I'll give you guys a sec to catch up on that. This cycle we're going to talk about, America passed this thing called the Howley-Smoot Tariff. Awesome name. Um, I'm not going to be like really worried about if you know how to pronounce it, just as long as you remember there was this really important tariff that was passed. It raised tariffs to the highest level in American history. Why? We mentioned already, to reduce that trading with war-torn Europe. It wanted to protect the United States. Hey, we shouldn't get involved in trading with these nations that are in incredible amounts of debt because if they can't make those payments back, we're not able to make any money. Meanwhile, the effects of World War I still lingered. Germany still owed France and Britain billions of dollars from the Versailles Treaty, which was money it borrowed from the United States. The U.S. was also owed billions of dollars from Britain and France for helping aid the Allies in World War I. We mentioned this the other day, we're getting into our cycle. We talked about the Dawes plan that was put in place. And again, on paper, the idea was that this was going to help stimulate Germany's economy. It was gonna help stimulate Britain and France's economy, which then in turn, we would make our money back plus interest. However, one of the potential problems here, which America didn't really think about, and a lot, again, this was, this was presidents, people in politics, people in economics, no one had worried about what happens if our business and our stocks and our industries start to fail. 
But one of the obvious issues is by looking at this, if all of a sudden America bottoms out and starts to fail, maybe goes through a Great Depression, that not only impacts us, but it impacts Germany, it impacts Britain and France, and then we lose a lot of that ability to gain our interest and our payments back from those nations. It kind of takes the whole system down. So I guess I'll go back. Again, keep that in mind as we're moving forward. We're going to see that the effects of World War I and trade are going to have a big problem. Also, think about this. If we start to bottom out, if we start to – our stocks prices go down, what we're manufacturing, the goods we're making go down and decrease, we've already – uh, raise these tariffs. There is no other country that now wants to trade with us and we're going to be able to kind of help dig ourselves out of because of said tariff. So this risk reward ends up kind of biting America in the butt down the road. Our second aspect is going to be in the world of agriculture. Hashtag farming. Now farmers had already started kind of what they called their own Great Depression in the early 1920s. After World War I ends, there is a huge decline in the demand for, for food. It's quite simple. We don't need to be producing the same massive amounts of food for our soldiers, for our troops, for our families, for our allies. However, before this all kind of happened, farmers had taken out loans. They had gone and bought huge acres and tracts of land. They had gone out and bought uh, tractors, different kind of machines, different kinds of turbines and combine and things that would make it so they could mass produce food faster than ever before. Again, logically thinking here though, everybody, if they now have less of a demand to make stuff, they still have taken out loans on the land, on the crops, on the machines. If they're not making money off of their profits from the food they're growing, they're not able to pay back their loans or pay off their interest on different um, items that they've bought. A great deal of farmers ended up defaulting on loans taken out in the 19 teens, early 1920s. So then what happens? If farmers can't make their payments, we go back to the idea of foreclosure. The banks that gave them the loans come in and repossess that property and the equipment take it away. So now if farmers don't have land, they don't have their farms, they don't have the, the technology to make anything, what do we have even less of? even less food than before. So now we're kind of spiraling down and down and down to tr we're realizing there's less food being made, there's less jobs being provided, there's less money being simulated. The US tried to help, but the help isn't quite what it seems to be. They put in these short-term fixes. They put in price supports, which were laws to keep pr prices of crops above a certain level so that the farmers could still try to make some money off of the crops they were making, although this inflated number ends up becoming kind of a farce. So this was a huge problem. And again, this is happening right after World War I and it's something that people aren't kind of taking notice of until later down the line. A little bit about the Great Depression and farms. On top of the demand for their crops going down, farmers in the southern Midwest also had to deal with one of the worst droughts in American history. With no rain, crops were not able to grow. Obviously, you guys are all aware of how a drought works. The soil, essentially what was left of it was just topsoil and dirt, um, turned to dust. Nothing could grow. This isn't something that makes no sense. It's more of something people didn't plan for because we don't have the, the science and medical fields that we do now to understand botany and biology and chemistry and how the, how the land works. This area of the country, as you guys can see, we're talking Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, Nebraska, our, our, our bread basket, our wheat belt, where all these crops are grown, has had farmers and people living on it growing crops since the early 1800s year after year after year after year there's not like there hasn't been a ton of technology changing so when you have workers and farmers using shovels and different kinds of things like that basically that soil you're only using the top end of the soil and i wish i could draw like i usually draw my ma and pa fenner farm on this lesson unfortunately i can't do that for you guys today that topsoil has been used for generations hundreds of years and now it's essentially had all the nutrients and the, and the good parts of that soil is gone. They can't dig far enough down into the parts of the earth where they can dig up the new soil to kind of replenish it. And now it's turned to dust. 
So that drought is happening. And what that dust eventually leads to is one of the greatest uh, kind of like most historical weather events that's ever happened in American history known as the Dust Bowl. All of that topsoil has risen to the top of this land that can't be turned into crops and can't have crops growing anymore. And that topsoil eventually picks up steam. Um, when again, we're talking about this part of the country, another name for this part of the country, you think of another phenomena, a natural um, occurrence that happens there is tornadoes. We call this tornado alley because the land is so flat. There's nothing to, when the weather start or the wind starts to swirl and pick up, there's nothing out here to get in the way of it. There's no trees, there's no buildings, there's no crop, there's nothing that gets in the way of it. The weather comes up over the Rocky Mountains on this side, comes down with a head of steam from Colorado, New Mexico, and picks up all of this topsoil. On our store or on our episode of America, the story of us, we are going to get a first live look at uh, the Dust Bowl and how just horrific it was. So again, this is an actual photo, as you guys can see here, from Life on a Prairie out in Kansas of what we're talking about hundreds of feet in the air, stories high dust that would settle and lay over this land for days, weeks at a time. Spoiler alert, if this is going on where these farms are trying to grow crops, it's blocking out the sun. Crops need sun to grow, photosynthesis, hashtag science, hashtag cross curricular. Um, not to mention, can people go outside or do anything? Can farmers leave their homes? Hashtag 2020 pandemic jokes. Can they even go outside to till the farms to take care of their animals? No. Um, this event ends up becoming a huge problem. It kills many of the cattle and pigs and different kinds of animals and chickens that are growing on these farms. It makes it so crops can't grow. And even worse, the Dust Bowl causes people to leave. Now, I know we're not always great with directions here. If you live in this part of the country and weather is moving from west to east, these dust bowls, which we're going to see in the story of us, are going to pick up here in the Midwest America, and they're going to go all the way across places like Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, Pennsylvania, out to New York. So many of these families picked up, closed up their farms, and headed west moved to places like California where they could grow different types of crops and use their profession in a whole different way. As it says here, families packed up everything, moved west, hoping for a better life. At this point, the, the people in the Dust Bowl had not a lot of money. They had lost their homes and their farms. They had lost their ability to produce food with their crops. They had lost the ability to maintain even livestock like cattle, like pork, like chickens. Um, so they have no way to make money. Again, I will go back to talking about how now we have our, in our country, we have less trade with other nations. So we're not trading these resources to other places. We're not bringing in other, um, pork or cattle or chickens from other parts of the world. We're not producing it ourselves. These are, you can start to see the slippery slope of how things are connecting together. Our third thing is going to be the American economy. We're going to see a big drop in the housing market, which then leads to a drop in other related markets. A lot of these, what we what was thought to be solid industries are starting to struggle. Again, think about it. If people have less food, if people are not selling this food, if people have um, less trade with other nations, we're just making less money slower and slower and slower. Places like railroads, lumber, textile, steel industries were beginning to struggle. The prices of goods start to rise because as less stuff is being made when it's becoming more and more um, hard to get, the value of it and the rarity of it goes up so the price goes up. People are not able to afford food that is now all of a sudden increasing. People aren't able to afford um, leisure and luxury items. Also, at this time, wages were not rising at an equal rate as those prices. So as the price of goods and services starts to increase, you're still making the same amount of money. A loaf of bread was 50 cents last week and you were making however many thousands of dollars a year. Now a loaf of bread is a dollar or two dollars or three dollars. And again, for, for context of bigger things, these bigger industries start to rise their prices on things, raise their prices on things as well. People can't afford to buy it. 
Also, this is where we finally get caught up in our unequal distribution of wealth. We talk about our Rockefellers, our Carnegies, our multi, multi, multi billionaires. Most people weren't living in that way. Even to be a millionaire in the 1920s and 30s was a very, very rare thing. The rich get richer, the poor get poorer. We'll explain this a little bit in more detail here, but essentially think of it this way. As goods become more expensive, workers are not receiving any raise in their money. It makes it harder for workers to, to pay for things. And eventually there's going to be, think about again, the demand for this stuff. As people are unable to afford it, there's less demand for it. But people continue to produce and make things. Eventually these factories or these places where they make railroads or lumber or steel, if they're making too much stuff, they're wasting time, energy, and money. They have to lay off workers. And as they start to lay off workers, those workers get laid off. Now they don't have a source of income. They can't pay for the said goods and services. They can't pay for steel. They can't pay for food. And as that cycle continues to go, it gets worse and worse and worse. Here's where we're going to kind of lay that out simply. The working man's problem. So as being a worker at this point, maybe in like a factory, a steel factory, let's say, industries were producing too much stuff. So companies are losing money because they're making stuff no one's buying. So you have to lay off workers or cut their wages. If you lay off workers, they're not making any money. If you cut their wages, they're still making less money, but they're probably, I've never gone into a job being like, hey, I know you guys are paying me, whatever. I'd like to make less money. So p workers get upset, workers get frustrated. This leads to a lot of tension. Second thing, people who were fired from these jobs or have lower wages now can't afford to buy stuff. They now have to pick and choose. Well, I can't go buy movie tickets or I can't go buy new siding for my house or I can't go buy new tires for my car. Those things just aren't what I need. I need shelter, I need food, I need to survive. Ipso facto, so companies that weren't selling much in the first place would lower their prices to try to make more money. But as you're lowering the prices, you can't afford to pay your workers because you're making even less money. So then what do you have to do? You have to lay off more workers. You have to cut more wages. Are we sensing what this, the cycle looks like here? This is not good. Even more so to think about that, banks weren't lending money at this time. So businesses couldn't afford to continue making products or paying their workers because if less people are making money, think about it. If you've lost your job or you've had your wages cut, you're going to the bank and taking money out. The bank is having more money taken out of it and withdrawn for people just trying to kind of maintain and survive. So the bank has less money to give out for loans for these businesses. So if your business spirals from laying off and cutting wages to more laying off and cutting wages, what happens to these businesses, they will eventually close. And then all those workers that are left have no wages at all. We see that problem continue. Businesses go bankrupt. Oh, I wish it would go away. That thing at the bottom. More workers are even more workers are laid off. More people who cannot afford to buy the products because they don't have any money. So I hope this makes sense. It's a little bit harder to describe through here, but try to lay this out as simple as possible. Our next part of this, which again, nobody could have thought that was going to happen or have foreseen, was the idea of buying things on credit and using the stock market. For the first time in American history, people were in debt and they were okay with it. Because the economy and the stock market continued to rise, it always continued to rise. So when you bought stocks, they went up. When you bought things on credit, you never had to worry. You were able to pay it back. Problem with going into debt is whether you realize it or not, you are putting, you're risking the fact that you might not be able to make that next payment. And then you will accrue interest. All you young whippersnappers out there, as you're going to be thinking about getting credit cards soon, or maybe some of you have them already, this is why you want to start off with a small limit on how much you can spend. My first credit card wasn't like, ah, oh, you can spend $10,000, Mr. Chris. And I'm like, yes, ball in. And I just went out and bought candy and TVs and video games. And that's a terrible analogy. It makes me sound like a six year old. But the idea of, you have to be careful with what you could, whether you realize it or not, using a credit card is you're buying the thing now and then promising to pay it back later. 
Many people never had this before, nor did they know how to deal with it. These were new things to Americans at that time. Prior to the 1920s, you had to have that amount of money to buy whatever it may be. Credit was also offered to everyone. Now, if you guys go to the bank and try to get a credit card or try to open accounts, they're going to run background checks on you. And most likely at your guys' age, they're going to have a parent co-sign that with you. It's going to be, well, let's see what mom and dad do. Um, how much money do they make? Are their jobs steady and stable? What do we feel comfortable giving this person as far as a credit? How much credit should they be given? And most of the time, as you guys see, because of your, your age and how young you are, they're going to start you off with a small amount. And you're going to have to kind of earn that trust with the bank. As you've been a customer or you've been at a bank for a long enough time, you can eventually increase it, increase it, increase it. But in the 20s, that didn't exist. You wanted a credit card? Boom, here it is. You wanted to go ahead and take out a loan? Boom, that's totally fine. Stop saying boom, Mr. Chris. So no background in credit checks. Stocks were bought on credit. Yes, stocks could be bought without actually passing on money. People were taking out loans to put money in the stock market because the stock market continued to rise and rise and rise. This is a pretty big gamble for people to be putting down with money they didn't actually have. But again, to their credit, at this point in American history, they had never had to worry about that. Every time people bought stocks, the stock went up, they made more money. The stock market was not regulated by the government. No one was checking to see what these stocks are valued at, who's making the value on them, whether that's actually accurate or not. Led to a thing called speculation. Essentially, you had people trying to figure out, uh, this is what we believe this company is going to be worth. This is what we think the direction it's going in. Oh, it's going to be going up. Business is going to be booming. You better buy your stocks now so that you can make your money back and then some. All of this leads to, as you can guess, the stock market crash. I'll leave that there for you guys for a second. Now, that stock market crash that we're going to get to in 1929, many people had bought stocks on margins. And not just people, by the way. Banks had invested in the stock market. Businesses had invested in the stock market. Companies, corporations. So this wasn't something that just affected human beings as individuals. But if you worked for a company that was dabbling in the stock market and then they lost all their money, you lose your job. If you worked, if your bank had put money and put some of that money in the bank into the stock market, thinking it would grow and be able to keep money to invest in businesses, your, your money might just be gone. Again, to KISS, keep it simple, silly, Dwight Schrute, Dwight, uh, office things. Let's put it this way. If a stock is $100, you could give them $10 to pay on margin. All right, so I'm handing over my $10 bill. I essentially tell you, I'll get you the $90 later, but I have a good feeling this stock is going to increase. So when the stock doubles, my $100 stock is now worth $200, correct? So I still owe you as the bank $90. I can happily hand that over, and I just turned my... $10 bill that I actually had into after I get done paying my $90, I just gained a hundred extra dollars. So that's great. If you can buy stock on margin and it's going to go up, that's amazing. On the flip side, as those things start to fall and the great depression takes off, now you've only given $10, you owe the bank $90. Now guys, this is a tiny, tiny example. Clearly people are spending hundreds, if not thousands of dollars. I'm just trying to keep our math small here because I'm not good at math. Uh, if that stock falls, the person now, so you gave 10, you owed 90. Let's say the stock goes to zero. Okay, well you lost your $10. You still owe $90 to the bank. And for a lot of these people, companies, corporations, not having that money, meant they had no way of paying it back, which meant that their interest continued to rise, which put them in even more debt than they were in the first place. And a lot of times this led to many people spiraling into debt that they had no way of paying for. As you can see here in this photo down below, we have somebody actually just trying to sell their car for a couple hundred dollars just to make some money to be able to pay off his debts and his loans. 
with people panicking about their money, especially with people as this kind of this panic starts to ensue where people are like, oh my gosh, these stocks aren't worth anything. My money's being lost. This leads to a huge decline in stocks. People aren't buying stocks anymore. People aren't um, spending that money anymore. Stocks eventually, as people figure out what's happening, they take all their money out of the stock markets before they lose it. Now stocks are pretty much worthless and these companies and businesses aren't getting money from their stocks even less money to build things, to make things, to whatever. You guys kind of get the point by now. Now they're going to have to close or lay off more workers. People who bought money or who bought on margins couldn't pay those things off. Investors were average people that were now broke. Dun, da, da, da. I want to mention President Herbert Hoover during the 1920s. We talked about him in our last chapter a little bit. He is the president at the start of the Great Depression. His general philosophy, we'll make it. Man, what a, what a wonderful philosophy. What he does, okay, the answer is nothing. Now, that's not like a Mr. Chris hot take, hate on Herbert Hoover. That is what his general philosophy was, is very laissez-faire, laissez-faire politics. He believed the government shouldn't get involved and be bailing these companies out and bailing businesses out. He basically said, well, this is a small recession, it will fix itself. Essentially, it will kind of work itself out like it always does and the economy will get back to normal. Really not taking into account all the stuff that we just talked about. At the time, however, the people who were losing everything, our farmers, our businessmen, our stockbrokers, people who had lost it all were looking for some kind of help. What do we do? How do we fix this? A um, little background here. He wins the election of 1928 as a Republican, his first position in politics ever. Not a governor, not a mayor, not a senator, not anything. He was first elected job he gets as the president. So this leads some people to be kind of skeptical and kind of give Hoover some hate from, from back in the day. He and his administration, like I said, believed that by letting these problems play out, America would be fine. Laissez-faire. It will fix itself. However, as the Great Depression begins and then lasts and goes on and goes on and goes on, a lot of people blame him for doing exactly that, nothing. Why aren't you able to help give people some kind of stimulus, give people some kind of money? Um, like we're seeing right now currently in our kind of mini recession, what's going on in 2020, uh, depending on when you're watching this and what date you're listening to this, you might talk to mom or dad or friends or family. The President Trump is handing out what's called a stimulus package. They're giving out money to citizens, hoping that that, amount, that money goes out to people and they will spend it. They will put it back into the economy for people to work on houses, for people to work on cars, for groceries, for whatever it may be to stimulate the economy. And again, we are going to see, we'll talk more about the Great Depression. It's not going to be a very uplifting chapter, but it's a fascinating kind of psychological impact of we're going to see people in bread lines. We are going to see people who have lost everything, kind of the, the American spirit of what, what you're going to have to choose to do. This gets out of control when we see that, again, once the stock market crashes and all of these other things have kind of trickled down at the same time, the, the amount of jobs that are lost, the amount of money that is gone is staggering. This is an actual photo of Christmas Day bread lines in New York City. These are all men lined up around, again, across the street. And this line actually goes back around the block behind these buildings here. Hundreds and hundreds of people looking for food that they can't have water, clothing, whatever it may be. Um, police stand guard outside the entrance to New York's closed World Exchange Bank. When you watch the story of us, we're also going to talk about bank runs. And we're going to see as people started to figure out that these banks didn't have the money that people thought was in there, everyone rushes to the bank at once to try to take their money out. And a bank only keeps a certain amount of cash in it. So after it's given out, X amount of dollars to people, they're out of money. Unemployed men vying for jobs at the American Legion Employment Bureau in LA during the Great Depression. Um, again, these were jobs that were given out on a more of a day-to-day -day basis. Hey, we need five workers today. And tomorrow we need seven. The next day we need four. And these guys would line up and basically wave their arms and beg and beg and beg to be chosen to make wages for a day. 
unemployed workers in front of a shack with Christmas tree, East 12th Street, New York City. This is going to be an example of our shanty towns and basically kind of essentially people living in the streets, their makeshift homes. Um, again, very unsanitary, very unhealthy places. We're going to have an activity where I'm going to have you do a little reading uh, about Hoovervilles and shanty towns, and you're going to get a first look at what that was. To put this in perspective, I know this is hard for you guys to care about because A, guys are in high school. B, not all of you guys work, and that's totally fine. C, is just the idea of having to, to worry about employment and things like that right now, health insurance, benefits, mortgages, car payments. Those aren't things you guys have to worry about and enjoy that as long as you can. The unemployment rate in the United States during the Great Depression reaches 25%. You're like, what does that mean? For reference, in America uh, last year, maybe a year and a half ago, unemployment was at 4%, maybe 3 um, An average unemployment rate in our country has been right around 7 8%, 9% for the last 15, 20, 30 years. So we're talking about one in every four people, one in every four families had no jobs, no source of income no way to pay for heat, electric, water, food, bread. That's a staggering number. Think about in our classroom, if we were looking around, how many students we have in class, one out of every four people had nothing. So pretty scary number. Again, just some actual photos here because we're in a time where we can look at that stuff. Um, we see basically what people are kind of forced to hunting and finding their own kinds of foods. This guy, my man here is eating a turtle that he found. Uh, wow, he, he is not pro save the turtles. He does not want to drink out of a Starbucks, uh, whatever that flat mug thing without the straw. Great sentence, Mr. Chris, you're all over it. Like I just mentioned, by the early 1930s, approximately one in four people in the nation were unemployed, had nothing. So in the wrap up sense here, the causes of the Great Depression, we have less trade with the rest of the world. We have the payments and damages left over from World War I. We see the decline in agriculture and our farmers losing everything. We see our sense of less things being made, less workers making money, more workers being laid off. And then finally, our credit and stocks finally catch up to us, all leading toward Black Tuesday and the great crash in the stock market. Once all of these things have combined, America will stay in a depression um, until the mid to late 1930s. And we're going to talk more about how we tried to fix those things going forward and what we tried to do to get out of it. All right. So that's it for your lesson right now. After you guys are done taking care of your notes, please, again, go to our classroom. You're going to see your lesson for the Great Depression on FlowCab is posted there. Fill in those lyrics. Make sure you're clicking turn in on everything. Uh, I appreciate you guys. As always, thank you for bearing with me. I'm, I know this isn't the perfect way to do this. Um, I appreciate you guys doing your work. You've all been wonderful so far. Keep doing what you're doing, okay? So everybody stay healthy, stay happy, stay safe, um, and I will see you guys soon. All right?